Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Let's get in the Word this morning, and I'm going to open to probably some unfamiliar scripture to start out with. I really felt the Lord to stir me from the book of Judges. So I'm going to go to the book of Judges. I'm going to read one verse from the book of Judges, and then I'm going to kind of do a brush stroke of what the book of Judges is about. But let me just say this to you. Every book of the Bible, probably the key to that book is somewhere near the door. How many of you like, I probably shouldn't ask you this, but how many of you probably have a key hidden near the door of your house somewhere? It's either under the mat, it's under the, uh, you know, it's got a magnetic thing under your grill or it's up on the gutter or it's in a windowsill or it's on a hook under the porch or something. And the key is somewhere near the door. Sometimes you've got to find the key to that door. The book that precedes this, which was the the book of Joshua, starts out by saying, Now Moses, my servant, is dead. And then Joshua arises because Moses could bring them out, but Joshua was going to bring them in. How many know Moses brought you out with a rod, but Joshua brought them in with a mercy seat? To me, that powerfully pictures what I see uh, through the scriptures is I try to see everything through the lens of Christ because how many know that the Old Testament is Jesus concealed and the New Covenant is Jesus revealed? And there are powerful pictures of redemption all through the scripture and it's almost as if God is telling a covenant journey through pictures and types and shadows. How many can see, first of all, just to be very basic, that the lamb that was taken out in Exodus chapter 12, uh, that was taken out from among the sheep and the goats and the blood was applied to the doorpost. How many know because we have some revelation in the new covenant, we can see that that's a picture of Christ. How many can see that? How many's glad for the lamb? How many's glad for the blood of Jesus that you could put blood on the doorpost of the house, take a lamb inside the house, eat it in the night, and you get enough lamb in your belly and something in you says, I can't live in this bondage anymore. You got to get up and leave it. But when we see, you know, know, the books preceding the book of Joshua, it's all led by Moses and it's about a coming out. And then Joshua comes on the scene and you may or may not know this, but the name Joshua is the Hebrew name Yeshua. It is the name of Jesus. So when I see this book like Joshua opening, say, now Moses, my servant is dead. It's a powerful picture to me of the transition from an old covenant to a new covenant. Now, I'm going to take my time and teach a little bit this morning. I might rear back and preach, but I really want to kind of develop some of these thoughts. This is some fresh stuff for me. Hallelujah. So I'm kind of guinea pigging you a little bit. Are you all right with that? So if you'll nod and say amen once in a while, it'll really help me out. Hallelujah. But when, when they brought them out and then Yeshua, Joshua starts to bring them in, there's a shift from an old covenant paradigm to a new covenant paradigm. I, I really feel like this is one of the key Probably the most powerful key to me of the revelation that God has given to me is being able to understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. How many know rightly dividing the word of truth when Paul wrote to Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth? Rightly dividing the word of truth doesn't mean you know Greek and Hebrew. It means you know what is, what is truth in relationship to the Old Covenant and what is true in relationship to the New Covenant. And I think the tragic thing today is that most of the church world are gripped with a mixture of both covenants. In other words, we draw from the law of Moses the parts of the law that fit our culture, and we call that the gospel. But how many know that when Jesus came, he offered us a new covenant? Come on, somebody. How many know that the old covenant was full of blessings and cursings? If you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you're going to be cursed. How many know in the new covenant... Uh, or under the old covenant, it says, thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt not. But when he introduces the new covenant in the book of Hebrews, he says, this is the covenant that I will make after them after those days. I will, I will, I will, I will, and I will. How many know the old covenant was about what you did? The new covenant is about what God did in Christ to bring you into himself. Come on, somebody. That's good news right there. And the new covenant has no curse. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. And you know, that's amazing because I think about it. I don't want to get too sidetracked here because it's Sunday morning, but if you go back to the book, I call it the book of Deuteronomy, and you start reading the blessings and the cursings, they they come down through the curses and they would stand on one mountain and the other group stand on the other mountain. They'd read the curses and the people would say after every, every, every curse, they say, and the people would say, amen. 
<laughs> you know, they'd say, curse it. it you, if you move a man's, you know, uh, markers in his land, the people would say, amen. Curse it are you if you do this. And the people said, amen. Curse it will you be if you do this. And the people together with one voice said, amen. They get over to the next book with the blessings. And he starts blessing. I'm going to bless you coming in. I'm going to bless you going out. I'm going to bless your kids, your cows, and your cash. And nobody said an amen to that whole chapter. There's not an amen in there. But when you get over into the book of Revelation, the Bible says, and Jesus says, I am the amen, the faithful truth. How many know in Christ all of God's promises are yes? There we got an amen on it. Somebody said amen to the blessing. Somebody say, so be it to me according to the blessing. That's the provision. Hallelujah. That's the good news about it. And so as you're transitioning from an old covenant to a new covenant, and really the whole New Testament is that shift. Even I don't want to get sidetracked here, but there's so much here to say. But there's a, there, there is an Exodus paradigm all the way through the New Testament because even on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appear to Jesus. And you may or may not know this, but the Bible says that Moses, who was the leader of the first Exodus, bringing them out of Egypt, is speaking to Jesus. And the Bible said that, he, that Moses talked to him concerning his decease. The Greek word for decease there is the Greek word exodus. That's not an accident. So here's the leader of the first exodus talking to Jesus, who's the leader of the real exodus. Because Moses brought them out of a physical bondage, but Jesus was about to bring them out of a spiritual bondage. And so there was this exodus that goes all the way through. So you got Yeshua coming on the scene in the New Testament to bring about some changes and to bring about a new covenant and bring about the blessing of God and to defeat the enemies once and for all and to hand us the keys of a kingdom with an ongoing mission of seeing the kingdom of God increase in the earth and an ongoing mission of new creation being delivered through a people that he could use in the earth. For he says in the book of Hebrews, for the world to come, he did not put in subjection to angels, but he put it in subjection to a son, and then he includes us as sons in that same chapter and heirs of God. Our mission is bigger than going to heaven. Amen. It includes that. But what's so missing in the American church, even when we start to teach things concerning the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, when Jesus said, would say the kingdom of God is like or the kingdom of heaven is like, he was not talking about other world stuff. He was talking about this world stuff. He was talking about not how I can get from here to there. He was talking about how I can get what's happening there to operate here. Your kingdom come. God invading this planet with heaven. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. God invading this planet with what's going on in the heavens. And if it ain't happening in his world, it shouldn't be happening in ours. And so I believe that there's a, uh, as you, you, you come out of the book of Joshua, it opens up and go ahead, you can go ahead and put that scripture if you have it, Judges chapter one, verse number one up on the screen for me. And because here's the key to this whole book. It says, now after the death of Yeshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, say, who shall go first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? That's, that's all I want you to read there in Judges for right now. So if the book of Joshua ends by saying, Moses, my servant, is dead, and Yeshua arises, which is a picture of Jesus to bring them into their promised land, and then this book opens by saying, now after the death of Yeshua. Now how many know uh, in, in the New Testament, are you tracking with me? In the New Testament, after the death of Jesus, well, let me come back again. In the Old Testament here, after the death of Joshua, Judges chapter 1 opens up, he, he calls 12 judges. I think this is interesting. In the New Testament, after the death of Jesus, he calls 12 apostles. He calls 12 apostles because they are the ones who will be the dispensers of the death, or what, can I say it like this, of what the death of Jesus, Yeshua, has exacted. So when I read the book of Joshua, what I see is a book of judges where there are some judges or there are some judgments that have been made that somebody can execute. In other words, we can, we can live in the, in the judgment that was in our favor. Go ahead and bring up Psalm 149. Go ahead and bring up the whole thing if you would. Let me, let me, let me, let me set the stage with this. We'll get rolling here in just a minute. Go ahead and can, can you, I, I know I didn't tell you to put the whole chapter up, but can you go back and get the whole chapter from verse number one? I probably shouldn't do it, but I, it kind of gets the whole setting. 
Psalm 149, verse 1, if we can go back up there and just uh, uh, take a look at that. Let the hap, okay, I'll give you a minute there. I'm going to open this because I hate a dry preacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you get me verse one? I think it says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Praise the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the saints. I could preach on just this chapter, but I need to just kind of hit Sing unto the Lord a new song. How many know the new song is not the latest one that Hillsong wrote? The new song was the new song of the new covenant. How many know in the new covenant, he makes all things new. His mercies are new. There's new tongues. There's new mercies that are new every morning. Uh, there's a new creation. There's, uh, uh, he makes all things new. So sing unto the Lord a new song. So to me, this song, this, this, this is a challenge to get people's praise into a dimension where they're praising not for what God is going to do, but what he's already done. How I many we can sing a new song because there's some stuff that's been done? It says, praise the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, uh, let his, and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Next verse. Let's Israel rejoice in their master or their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify or he will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. I could talk about singing from the posture of rest and from the place of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let them, the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. <clears throat> Next verse. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Now, let me talk just a minute about this two-edged sword. This two-edged sword to me comes from Hebrews chapter 4 because I'm going to talk about it a little bit when we get into the book of Judges a little bit further. But this two-edged sword to me speaks of the word that flows from rest. In Hebrews chapter 4, he says, let us labor to enter into rest. And then he says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder between soul and spirit. It is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. So the sword that we have today, how I many know we are not in a military battle of violence to kill people anymore, but we do have a powerful weapon in our hand called the Word of God, and we can come on, so we can use that weapon in a right way. It's two-edged. It is life-giving. It's not to kill. It is, is life-giving. The way it says it's quick and powerful in Hebrews. The word quick there doesn't mean it's fast. It means it's life-giving and powerful. It's not any word that's life-giving and powerful. It's the word that flows from rest or from the finished work of Jesus Christ. It divides asunder between soul and spirit. It will discern between the thought and the intent of the heart. And when you really hear the message of the gospel of grace and the finished work of Jesus Christ, what it does is really reveals what's in your heart. Not sometimes so you can act on it, but so you can come boldly to a throne of grace and receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of trouble. So there is a two-edged sword. He's talking about some weapons that he's given us as saints, and one of them is the high praises of God. It is the new song. It is a word that flows from rest. It is a sword of the Spirit that is in our mouth. Let a two-edged sword be in their hand. Go ahead, next verse. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples. Next verse. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Now, I don't think we're locking anybody up and tying anybody up today, but how many know we have power through our praise to bind the powers of darkness and to bind the powers of the enemy. I believe God wants to break some strongholds that's been over people's lives and some chains. Come on, somebody. And some ruling principalities and powers, and sometimes principalities and powers are not always demonic. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're just civil governments and civil thoughts. And sometimes, how I many of the church is called to bring forth wisdom, to speak wisdom to principalities and powers, to make known to them the manifold wisdom of God. How I many know some leaders, even in political places, might have to call on the church and say, we need
need some wisdom from above. We need somebody to say something that can change the culture or the situations of what's going on in this planet. Because how many of we're agents of God to execute something upon their note? To, in other words, how many of we have the power, even through our praise, to bind the activity of enemies over our lives and to bind depression? How many of you can't praise and be depressed at the same time? To bind their nobles with fetters of iron, next verse, to execute on them the written judgment, this honor, this honor have all his saints. Now I said that, I brought that scripture because this book of Judges, every one of these 12 judges that is in this book do something in the visible realm that's a, that is a picture of the redemptive work of Christ. And they do that to execute, let me say it like this, a judgment written. Uh, when I first started preaching Psalm 149, I, I, I used to be, you know, back in the day when I was kind of a legalist a little bit, before I really started seeing a lot about the new covenant and grace. I'd preach this like this judge, this, this honor, have all of his saints to execute the judgment written. I'm thinking that just means we need to rear back and call down fire from heaven and, you know, just, just prophesy judgment on everything coming and going. And my attorney happened to be in the, in the meeting the time I preached on it one time. He came to me after the service and he said, you know, Lynn, he said, you know, judgment's not always a bad thing. It's not always negative. I said, what do you mean? He said, if I'm ever in a court battle for you and there's a case against you, and the judge looks down and says, the judgment is in favor of the plaintiff, if that's you. That's good news. And so, uh, you know, how I many we, we, our mind always goes to the negative side when we see judgment. But I came to tell you this morning, there's some judgment that was exacted in your favor about 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And he starts talking about now is the judgment of this world come. He drew judgment into himself. And the good news is your judgment as a believer is not in your future. <coughs> Excuse me. It is in your past. How I many of his judgment was your judgment? There were some things in your favor, and you have been declared righteous and in right standing with God on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, and his resurrection took all that you had coming as far as punishment so that you could get all that he has of the blessing of God and in Christ. And it ought to be enough to shout about this morning is the fact that your judgment is not in your future. It is in your past. Hallelujah. That I don't have to stand in fear of anything because I know that there's some stuff. How I many even according to, uh, you know, what we have need of in our bodies, what we have need of in our finances, what we have need of in our families is that there's a judgment that has been exacted that is in our favor. That he says, I'm for you. I'm not against you. I'm going to bless you. Come on, somebody. We've not been, we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, but how I many know we've not been redeemed from the blessing? Then my attorney says to me, do you know what it means after the judge says, you won the case, the judgment is in your favor? I said, well, I think I do. He said, I, said, uh, he, I, said, I think I do. He said, it means absolutely nothing. I said, what do you mean? He said, if you don't go cash the check and execute the judgment, in other words, if you don't stand on what was just awarded you, you could be the richest man. We used to have a man in our town. I bought him several meals because he slept on park benches, always had shoes that didn't match, ate out of trash cans. And after I bought him several meals, I was in the bank one day, and the banker told me, he said, you know, he said, I know you all mean to do good for people. You know, he said, but you know, the guy that you buy lunch for a, a good bit has got the maximum amount of money that you can have in all three banks in this county. I said, you're kidding me. And the guy sleeps on a park bench. He said, yep, he's got a poverty mentality. He died on a park bench. Having the wealth that was inexhaustible with the maximum amount of money he could have under FDIC covered in all three of our banks. I thought, how would you, you know, that, how many of that, though, that, that really speaks to me? Because sometimes we in the body of Christ are setting on the wealthiest judgment that was exacted in our favor. 
and we never take our faith and grab hold of it and bring it into the visible realm, and we never execute the judgment that was written. But this book is about these men coming who are ordinary people, who do extraordinary things. And the thing that I love about this book is that these every single one of these men and women in this book that he, that he names and do extraordinary things are people who are flawed with human failure. Now, I don't know if that helps you or not, but to me, it makes me, it makes me want to shout that he don't name a glow-in-the-dark preacher. He uses ordinary people with extraordinary circumstances and unordinary weapons to bring about and execute the judgment and he starts out in the very first one of them. I'm just going to go through a few of these and not cover all of them. That's why I said I'm going to do a brushstroke this morning. He starts out with Othniel, and it says concerning Othniel that he was Caleb's younger brother. That's the main thing that it has about him. He was Caleb's younger brother. So it starts out with somebody who's got a younger brother syndrome, a little brother syndrome. Ever been in the shadow of a big brother? And know everybody knows who your big brother is. And, you know, you know, I have a big brother. Let me just tell this story a little bit about my brother. My brother pastors, and my son is actually working with, one of my sons is working with my brother uh, as one of his associate pastors. But my brother, you know, uh, he was going through a, a situation uh, because he re reached out to people in our community that were uh, substance abuse uh, victims. Like the, he, he runs a thing called Life or Drugs, and he also runs another thing called Team Hope, which is a program that it helps people whose children are the children of addicts. And so he really has reached out to our community. When he started to reach out to our community, uh, he had a really strong church about 20 miles from us. And when he started to reach out to these people, Stu, the broken, the wounded, the hurt, his money people came to him, the people in the church that support said, we don't know if we want these kind of people in our church. And if you're going to continue to do this, we're going to leave until it's their children. Y'all are too quiet for me. Until it touches one of their children. It's a national nightmare right now. I'm telling you, fentanyl and heroin and methamphetamine is just, it's, there's not a family that's not touched with some of this stuff. But my brother said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to help these people who need help because if you got to go, you got to go. So, the, so his money folk left him. And so he was in the place where he literally ended up selling his building. He said, I'm going to have to sell my church because I just can't make the payments. I've got a lot of people coming, but they don't have any money. They're just, they're needing help. So he sold his church and he felt like a real failure. Him and I were doing a conference then in South Carolina. He, uh, the, the pastor had asked me, him, my son, and my sister, who was the senior pastor where I attend. All four of us, he wanted four houses to do this conference. When my brother got up, he was in the middle of this, and he said, you know, when you have a brother, now I'm younger than he is, he's the oldest, I'm next, and there's five more siblings after me. He said, when you have a brother that's successful, you're happy for your brother, and you're thrilled for him, but when he's hugely successful, and you're about to lose your building, he said, you just feel like a failure. And then he said, you know, my sister was there, and she said, when you have your sister who takes your dad's ministry and his, his successor, and in one year she doubles the size of it, you feel like a failure. He said, when I go to Lynn's conference, Stu comes every year. He said, people walk up to me and say, oh, you're, you're Lynn's brother. And that was the syndrome. He felt like he was in, it's like, I'm Lynn's older, you're Lynn's older brother. So all I was known as is Lynn's brother because, you know, that's the environment they were in. But what he didn't know is that the, the very week I came down through there, I uh, came to do this conference together with him. I had gone to the courthouse because I got a summons to serve on court duty and because I traveled, I was going to see if I could get out of this. I said, you know, people take their vacations months in advance. We, 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 you know, we schedule the stuff and so I can't be on call and then not show up with people. And so I'm trying to explain to the clerk what I do. And she looks at me and she says, oh, I know who you are. You're Jack's little brother. And so when I got up, I told that story. I said, so in my conference, he's my brother, but in this city, I'm his little brother because my brother literally pastors our city and he has breakfast with federal judges. Law enforcement has brought a massive change. How many can see that what happens is, is what we have to do is see our success 
is not measured by who knows your name. It's measured by the being in the thing you've been called to do and staying in your lane. And he's hugely successful now. And people are, I mean, now he's got another building and God is blessing him for reaching out to people who need help. Are y'all hearing where I'm coming from? I'm just trying to talk about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. The next thing, the next guy was a guy named Ehud. And he was a Benjamite, and his problem was he was left-handed, but he had a two-edged dagger. And he thrusted it into this king who was uh, by the name of Elon. And this king named Elon, the Bible said that he was very heavy with flesh. And uh, the Bible says that Ehud took this two-edged da dagger. Now, remember, I just read to you something about a two-edged sword. When I think about Benjamin, Ehud, he was left-handed. So he was like, okay, I'm different. I'm a southpaw. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm trying to get you to see that everything about these people was something different, but they were ordinary people using extraordinary, God was using them in an extraordinary way. And he took this dagger, the Bible says, and he went into the king Elon, who was heavy with flesh. Now, when I think about Ehud being a Benjamite, how many know the apostle Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin? So when I think about this guy going in, hallelujah, he's a guy who understands the Pauline revelation of the two-edged sword and the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I see Elon as a religious system that's so heavy with flesh that he don't know what to do. And it's, uh, it's almost, uh, Scripture calls him obese. How I many of the Bible say you fat? You probably fat. <laughs> it's kind of like when it says he was well old and well stricken in years. My mother used to say to me, have you noticed there's no old people around anymore? I said, Mom, when there's nobody above you, you are the old people. And when my mother passed away two years ago, it dawned on me. I'm the top of the food, G. I'll come on, somebody help us a little bit here. But the Bible said Elon was a, he a fat man. It said he was heavy with flesh. And I think to myself, God is raising up some people that are left-handed. They're not doing it the same old way as everybody else, but they've got a word that flows from rest. They've got a revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that message, can I tell you, is penetrating the flesh of a religious system who couldn't produce anything but obesity because it's fat on feeding and not doing anything. And it, he, the Bible said he thrust that sword in of the, uh, the two-edged sword and, and, it, and, and until the, the half, I mean, it's very vivid, and says, till the dirt came out. I got to tell you, man, you know what I see happening all over this planet right now, even the shift since COVID, is God is releasing the message of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the message in the gospel of grace, the message of the new covenant, the message of the kingdom, and it is taking, the, and God is getting the dirt out of a system of religion that has been heavy with flesh. If I sat here and told you some things that are happening in denominations, even around some of the private meetings I've had with some of the major voices in this country who are beginning to make a shift towards an understanding of a two-edged sword that's not a sword you beat people over the head with. I think folk are tired of going to church and being told how bad they are and being beat up when they walk in. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.